if you're dealing with the Society of Jesus, the all uh, complaints and claims for compensation are directed to Simon Davies here at the Jesuit head office. Uh, Brian McCoy, the provincial, also works out of that headquarters. Uh, claims are usually negotiated by lawyers from both sides. Uh, it's an adversarial type of process. The settlements and compensation amounts and the names of the offenders are never disclosed by the Society of Jesus. A uh, survivor has to sign a deed of release which says full release and confidentiality to receive any compensation. Um, so which bits you're not allowed to talk about, I'm not really sure. Uh, but you're also saying you'll never ever ask for anything again. So there are really three options you have, if, particularly I'm talking here about the Society of Jesus, but it applies to other institutions as well. well here is a, a map of the possibilities. Um, you have the National Redress Scheme. You have what you call an informal claim direct to the institution or sometimes a diocese or archdiocese. And you have a civil suit, which is usually in the Supreme Court of Victoria. The other thing, if your problem was with a, uh, an archdiocese, the Towards Healing does still exist, but it's basically defunct because of the redress scheme. Mm. The other thing you can do, of course, is make a police statement, which might seem uh, not useful if the offender is deceased. It can help to just have a name on a database in the police files and they might be able to connect it to other complaints and reports. If the offender is still living, it's a very worthwhile thing to do, even though the likelihood of charges being laid are fairly small, you have to understand that. The problem is evidence, usually. Uh, often it's a matter of a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, offence and it's a, he says, she says, who do you believe? Even though in the George Pell case the, uh, the survivor of the abuse was actually believed over a powerful Catholic figure. The other thing that's not uh, very attractive is that you may have to go to court and give evidence and come up against a, a nasty defence lawyer like a Robert Richter, for example. The redress scheme uh, has what they call independent decision makers. Uh, they have guidelines, but the guidelines are secret. The public is not allowed to know about them. You can get a form online and fill it out. Uh, it's a little bit complex. You may need a lawyer to guide you through it. The matrix here for assessing monetary payments under redress is uh, severity of abuse gives you a score of 1 to 40, severity of the impact gives you 1 to 40, and the additional, additional elements up to 20 points. To get the full 100 points, the severity of the abuse has to be of a penetrative nature. So that is, uh, you know, rape, um, it can be digital rape perhaps, um, but it's penetrative and then you get possibly the 40 points. If it's not penetrative abuse, we don't really know what sort of points you can get, what sort of maximum point score you might get. Uh, the severity of impact of abuse is for the um, decision maker to figure out from your impact statements and your psychologist statements and those sorts of evidence that you supply. And the additional elements, 20, up to 20 points, if you are under state care or in a situation like a border at a school where you're under care 24-7, also disability plays a factor. So to get the full 100 points and get the full $150,000, you need to have penetrative abuse that has to have affected you very, very badly and you have to have been in a care situation. If that didn't occur, if it wasn't 
penetrative abuse if the effect on you was medium and not severe and if you weren't under care you're looking at more like it's hard to say but maybe fifty to seventy thousand dollars which is why they estimate that the average payout from the redress scheme will be about seventy six thousand dollars the redress scheme is really a, a a scam. It's a token payment. Uh, it could not have been better designed and written by the Catholic Church itself. The Minister for Social Services who oversaw the legislation was Old Severian Dan Tian. So I'm sure the Church and all the institutions are very happy with how he did it very much like the um, informal claim and like towards healing and the Melbourne response also previously. The redress scheme is a catch and kill type of process that the type that uh, USA tabloids use and buy a story and bury it. Uh, George Pell, it is said, was promoted to Cardinal by the Pope because he was, the Pope was so impressed with George's towards healing, because what it did was um, catch the complaints, pay them out very, very cheaply, get people to sign a deed of release. The whole thing was done. The survivor was brought in, you know, given a small check and told to go away, and the whole thing remained really a total secret. No one knew about it. No one knew anything about the offender. It was a brilliant solution and the redress scheme is not much different. The only good thing about the redress scheme really is the level of, call it proof if you like, is fairly low. So eligibility for redress will be assessed on whether there was a reasonable likelihood the person suffered institutional sexual abuse as a child. So the bar you have to get over is reasonable likelihood. Um, it's like a 51% proof in a sense that the, the independent decision maker has to decide on that. Now with the, in, the informal claim is the next thing. Uh, you need a lawyer to put together your documents and know how to make a claim. There are downsides to this in my opinion. The, uh, for example, the offender is not questioned or exposed during this process. The Society of Jesus or the institution are under no legal obligation to disclose information that they know. They may, they may not, it's up to them. Also, they never admit any liability as an institution. Uh, it becomes a game of lawyers bargaining with each other, their lawyers and your lawyer. Uh, having a bit of to and fro to see if they can come to some sort of agreement. Uh, also with the Society of Jesus and I imagine most others institutions, there is no real method of calculating the compensation amount in relation to harm done. Uh, the Society of Jesus have their own type of internal scale that they might use to make you an offer. Uh, this is highly variable it seems, it's arbitrary and you just never know what sort of figure they might offer to you. And it's believed that um, their amounts they might offer would might vary from as low as say $30,000 and perhaps even up to $1 million for very serious uh, penetrative abuse like rape. The other downside to this is that you will have to sign a deed of release. Exactly what you're not allowed to talk about, it's not clear, uh, but you have to sign off and say that you'll never make another claim as well. The whole thing is done secretly. The Jesuits never disclose the names of people they've made payments about, as let alone the amounts and the offender, if they are still living, pretty much escapes any responsibility. Now the civil suit is 
just something that is just so hard to do that you would be very reluctant. Uh, but sometimes you just might have to, and it's a it's a hard road, and you've got to learn about it, and you've got to get all your ducks in a row and be prepared. It's very expensive. It takes a long time, probably two years, perhaps more. It's very stressful. It's a very combative by nature, and it just gets dirty. The Jesuits have shown that they get very dirty when it comes to legal actions. Even though they have model litigant guidelines, at least in the last civil suit against uh, Scarbeck brought against the Jesuits, they certainly did not um, abide by those model litigant guidelines. The advantage of a um, civil suit is that the possibility of a higher payment is real. Uh, the offender will be named in the suit and also the institution usually. You know, for example, in New South Wales, November 2010, a former ward of the state was awarded $3.2 million. That was very serious abuse and had very serious effects upon that person. Uh, more recently, in 2019 versus Geelong College, uh, a settlement was made for $1.1 million. In Melbourne a few years ago, the Addis Israel School, which was um, Malka Leifer, who ran away, was helped to disappear back to Israel. Uh, the police here are still trying to extradite her back to Australia. The survivor there was awarded $1 million by Judge Jack Rush, uh, an old Zavarian, funnily enough. Also, early this year, and this is a good example of how things can and perhaps should be done, a survivor versus the De La Salle College in Reevesby Heights in Sydney, there was an uh, assessment done by uh, a separate judge to the one who uh, oversaw the trial. The assessment of damages was done in this way here. Non-economic loss is um, like pain and suffering, so the judge assessed him at, say, 50% of what would be the most serious. Uh, past economic loss, superannuation loss, interest on economic loss, future income loss, future superannuation loss and past medical expenses and future medical expenses, which totaled up to approximately one and a half million dollars. If the Society of Jesus were to do that for informal claims, that would be a much better situation. Uh, but they don't. They don't calculate economic loss, for example, as part of their um, compensation offer. What is missing in this situation really is something in the middle here between an informal claim and a civil suit. Um, the redress scheme could have been something like that if only they had a, an assessment matrix which is more like a, the Supreme Court would do and if they had um, no limit on the compensation that they could award. The redress scheme is not supposed to be compensation uh, but it has almost by default become a compensation scheme, which is very unfortunate. And also not being able to pursue a civil claim after accepting a redress payment is just wrong. It's just bad news for the survivor who might be in a very dire situation, uh, might just need money immediately to assist with living expenses and to stay functional uh, and be forced into a situation of having to accept a redress payment and never ever being able to in the future pursue what would be a, a proper and reasonable amount for the harm that was done to them. The other problem with compensation amounts for sexual abuse is that they are completely out of alignment with compensation for other things in, in our society. If you look at payments that people receive for defamation, uh, they are larger often than what a person gets for quite severe sexual abuse. A Perth worker 
who was startled by an office alarm and caused him some physical damage, uh, was awarded $2 million. When Alan Jones, the Sydney broadcaster, said things about the Wagner family of Toowoomba, about their business practices, um, the Wagners were awarded $3.4 million. In the USA, the highest payment I've read about has been $8 million to one survivor. Another occasion, four survivors were awarded $6 million. So when someone who has had a very, in my opinion, minor defamation, like the politician who a country newspaper said that she pushed someone, and when she was awarded, I think, $170,000 or something for that, it's uh, quite absurd when the redress scheme maximum is $150,000. Uh, with a civil suit, you will need a, probably, uh, a no-win, no-fee lawyer, unless you're very wealthy. Um, the cost can be half a million dollars or even more. Many people are, are quite afraid of that, understandably. Um, there is often a clause in a no-win, no-fee lawyer's contract that states that if you do not accept a settlement offer that they recommend you accept, then your agreement with them is terminated and you will be liable for all the costs. The survivor can get very boxed into a corner there. The lawyers might be keen to settle and take their money and run. The survivor might be thinking, well, that's not nearly an enough commensurate with the harm that was done. But they have a very serious problem about what to do there. With a civil suit, it drags on because the defending lawyers, especially the Jesuits, will start to pick apart, nitpick really, the statement of claim. They will say that this word is wrong, that date is wrong, that particular phrase is wrong, and um, ask that the claimant revise the statement of claim and submit it again. And then when that is done, they'll probably object to that as well. All this is um, adding to the time and the cost. In the case of uh, Scarbeck versus the Society of Jesus, the defence lawyers even requested access to uh, Scarbeck's uh, psychologist notes. Uh, after months of back and forth argument, uh, the judge actually did allow them access to some of the psychologist's notes. But all this just adds time and time and time and money and money and money. So if you're wanting to make a claim, it's not really that difficult to make your own assessment of the harm that's been done to you in monetary terms. Look at your life and look at what uh, you did do, look at the jobs and the work that you did have, look at the problems you may have had with uh, working maybe illness, maybe all sorts of things prevented you working full-time or continuously. Perhaps other things caused you to not attain a level of employment that you think you may have. Look at all that and do an assessment of what was uh, versus what could have been, which is what a judge will do in a, in a settlement decision. You can just be reasonable about that and in the end you'll probably surprise yourself as to how much loss income-wise you actually did suffer because of being abused. To sum it up, none of this is easy. Even the redress scheme, which is supposed to be the easiest, is very difficult and also time-consuming at the moment, as you can see from the figures. Only 5% of applications have actually been processed. 4,000 applications have been made on 1 July 2019, and they had processed 215 of them. Also, there are long delays now in October 2019 with the lawyers there are a number of specialist law firms who handle sex abuse cases. One of them, for example, has 315 cases on their books and they have, I think, about 
six or seven lawyers to work on them. So there could well be a couple of thousand cases on lawyers' desks waiting. Uh, there could be a huge pile piling up in the Supreme Court as well. So the whole process is really choking. There is just there are just too many cases to get through, which is why my own brilliant idea about having a an express civil court is to me a solution but I guess it's too hard for politicians to think about such a thing. So there you have it, it ain't easy.